Hello, I'm Jean-Philippe Courtois. Welcome to the Positive Leadership, the podcast that helps you grow as an individual, as a leader, and ultimately as a global citizen. To build a more inclusive, healthy, sustainable society, we need to help everyone get the skills needed to thrive in the digital economy, which includes becoming lifelong learners. So in an era where students learn through their devices, what role do schools play and what kind of schools are we talking about? And how can education e evolve to keep up the demands of a rapidly changing workplace and the big global challenges we face like climate change, among many others? It is something I'm very passionate about, both as a co-founder of my foundation, Live for Good, but also as a chair of a business school, Schema. And I believe we need to rethink the promise of education to support a more purpose-driven society and more inclusive education system, so nobody is left behind. These are some of the questions that focus the mind of my very, very uh, special guest today, Sal Khan, founder of the Khan Academy. A very warm welcome, Sal. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. And the Khan Academy is the online education platform with a mission of providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere, set up in 2008. The platform includes more than 70,000 interactive practice problems, as well as videos, articles on math, sciences, and humanities. It has more than 145 million registered users around the world. And today, Sal is working with more than 280 school districts in the States to help kids build foundational academic skills and make it easy as well for teachers to make data-informed decisions. He's also the founder, we'll discuss that later, of the Can Lab School in Mountain View, California, and Ken Wells School, a new online school. So again, fantastic to have you yourself to have this conversation. Um, I know you're someone who has always been keen to have a very meaningful life, to fulfill your potential by being what I'm, call, I'm calling a change maker. And I'm interested in where the desire comes from in the first place. So I'd like you maybe to start with some of your roots. I know you were born in 1976 to some Bengali parents your mom coming from India, I think, and your father from Bangladesh. So how did your family roots uh, in the culture around your family, siblings, and other influence your entrepreneurial approach? And did you have any role models in the family or beyond the family, maybe, that got you to morph from an hedge fund analyst, I think, <laughs> to a social entrepreneur? Yeah, that, uh, well, <laughs> uh, let me see if I, can, if I can connect some dots, maybe. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, my, my father came uh, to the U.S. in 1968. Uh, for those who don't know about U.S. immigration policy, that was the first, late 60s was the first time that they allowed significant immigration from uh, really non-European mm -hmm. countries. There was a healthcare worker shortage. Uh, so my father came uh, as a doctor, uh, and then he settled, yeah. he, he did residency in New Orleans, settled there. Then he had an arranged marriage to my mom in, 71, in 72. My sister was born in 73. I was born in 76. Um, my parents separated shortly thereafter. So un unlike most South Asian mm. families at the time, uh, they, you know, it was very unusual to not have both parents there. But so my mom raised us as a single mother. My father kind of uh, became a little bit yeah. um, and he passed away shortly, shortly afterwards. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, for me, uh, from an education point of view, it was helpful. My older sister, Farah, was uh, three years older and was uh, just naturally uh, a very good student. And so I think she became something of a role model for me. And also when you go to a, a, a teacher and you're, the teacher taught your sister three years before and she was bright, they just expect that you're going you. to do something, even if you don't <laughs> as show good as your... <laughs> uh, initial signs of it. So I think that was yeah. helpful. I think the other thing that was really helpful was... <clears throat> You know, we, we grew up pretty, um, you know, my mother worked essentially as a cashier at a fair, you know, mm. convenience stores mm. and things like that. So she was working minimum wage jobs. We were living yeah. probably right around the poverty line. Um, mm. But the fact that we were part of a South Asian community where, uh, you know, all of the other South Asian kids I knew, there weren't a lot in the 80s back then. Now yeah. there are more. Yeah. Um, you know, most of their families, because of the immigration policy, were doctors and engineers mm. and all of that. Yeah. So I think uh, in terms of identity, in terms of who you get to socialize with, and then when, you know, we would go from our apartment, we'd go to a party at one of their houses, and we're like, yeah. okay, I want to live like this one day. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you get like this? <laughs> how do you get there? Well, you you, you have there? to, yes. you know, yes. get your education. So I think th that's uh -huh. kind of the, the, the background. I think you, you, you know, mm -hmm. you fast forward to your question about maybe what, what 
inspired to go from being the hedge fund uh, person yeah. to working on Khan Academy and then giving up the hedge fund. I, I think it's a recognition mm. that um, my path uh, mm. and my sister's path and everyone I knew was so strongly supported by having a reasonably good education system. You know, the yeah. education system outside of New Orleans and Louisiana, it's not not famous. <laughs> no, no one talks about <laughs> it, but I will say, and it wasn't perfect, yeah. but mm. I had enough of an opportunity to uh, really tap into my potential. Mm. And so I think when Khan Academy was getting off the ground, there's a couple of paths to take it. One path was, hey, it's just going to be a fun hobby for me. Another path would yeah. be maybe I could be some type of a YouTube influencer type person in education. And that would have been fun. I would have made videos all day. Uh, another path would have been starting it as a, as a company of some kind. Um, but I, I recognize that something from something like education, I would have felt guilty when I was such a beneficiary of it, of, of a free mm. education. Uh, yeah. I would have, and even when I went to college at MIT, they gave me huge financial aid because my family didn't make much mm. money. So yeah. it would be hypocritical for me to say, hey, there's something that I think I could help deliver at very low marginal cost if I can get the right yep. philanthropic support. Let me at least try. And, you know, there could be many millions or hundreds of millions or billions eventually of students who can similarly tap into their potential. Yeah, yeah, I fully understand that. So let, let's come back to the time where, uh, because I, I remember listening to one of your, the podcasts uh, as a guest, you talked about, I think one day, I don't know if it was with, with one of your cousins, and, and there was a discussion about, he, he mentioned MIT, didn't even know what, it, what he was talking about, I think, right? <laughs> so can you tell us the way you, 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 you start dreaming about MIT, and when the dream came true, what, do you, what did that mean in your life? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well, it was actually, um, I, I remember the day very clearly. It was with my uh -huh. uncle. Uh, I was seven or eight years okay. old. And uh, my, you know, my mother's brothers ended up moving to New Orleans, younger brothers. And yeah. one of her uh, brothers, uh, one of the younger ones, he was at the time, I was seven years old. He must have been around 21, 22 years old. Mm -hmm. He was studying to be an engineer at the University uh -huh. of New Orleans. And yep. I remember seeing him doing his homework. And I said, what is this? And he said, oh, this is my, my math homework. And his, I was like, can you teach it to me? And he's like, no, 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 this is calculus. I remember the conversation very clearly. And, and, um, and I'm like, uh, well, what do you need calculus for? He's like, well, I'm studying to be an engineer. And I was like, well, what do engineers do? And he, he said, mm. um, well, you know, they, everything around you is built by some type of an engineer, um, yeah. everything. Yeah. And then I said, well, then I want to become an engineer. <laughs> and then he said, and he doesn't remember this, but I remember it very, very clearly. He's like, well, if you want to yeah. be an engineer, you should try to go to MIT. That's what yes. his, he just said it like, okay. randomly. And that, and that was printed in your mind and then, at eight. And then it was printed in my mind. <laughs> <So at eight. laughs> I, I, I had no idea wow. where it was, what it stood for or anything. But my uncle yeah. in whatever, it must have been 19... Uh, yeah. 83 convinced me that that's the best place to go if you want to be an engineer. So I was, I said, that's where I want to go. And even as so it was uh -huh. there, and then by the time I got to high school, I knew what it was. And that's when I yeah. actually, when I realized that it was not a joke to be able to go to a, a place like that, uh, that's when I got a lot more serious. And, you know, I, I honestly, yeah. this is where I give my sister a little bit more credit. When mm. I found out how much it costs uh, to go to universities like this, I said, there's no way we're going to be able to do this. Um, mm. So I would probably have given up on it. But yeah. my sister, uh, mm. who was three years older, she had gotten into Brown University, which is similarly oh. you know, yeah. expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But they gave her yeah. significant financial aid. And mm. had I, you know, she had loans and all of that, but they made it doable. And mm. had she not set that example, I probably wouldn't have thought that it was doable. I didn't know that these mm. schools would give they were pretty generous yeah. uh, for if you if you made a, a little and actually they've become more generous over time. So, um, yeah, that was a big deal. And, you know, when I got there, I've kind of I, I gave a um, address there uh, in 2012 and I referred to MIT as it was kind of for me, yeah. it was like going to Hogwarts. It's like Harry Potter going to Hogwarts of course. Uh, for, you know, it, it felt magical. It felt like I had found, uh, you know, in, in, in a typical uh, public high school, middle school, mm -hmm. You kind of have to play it cool a little bit. You you, yeah. you, you can't seem like you're too interested in things. You, you know, the, the and even the way the classrooms are structured, you can't really pursue your passions much. But, um, yeah. you know, when, when you go to a, a, a school like MIT, everyone around you is similarly curious. There's no shame in that. Um, yes. And, and to, to be around peers and around faculty who are literally trying to do 
things that could change the world. Um, it's yep. inspiring, and it makes you have a higher expectation for yourself. So it looks like there's really a family-led vocational journey to, to MIT between the uncle, your uncle, your, your sister. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about your cousin as well, because that's a famous story. So I'm sorry to ask you another time to tell the story. You know, when, when that happened, and the way you started tutoring your cousin, I think, in math uh, to, start, to start the concept. Yeah, you fast forward 2004. Um, yeah. At this point, uh, you know, after uh, after getting my engineering degree, I worked in Silicon Valley for a little bit. Then I went back to business school. Then after business school, to you know, you, as you alluded to, I, I became an analyst at a hedge fund in Boston. And so yeah. I was living in Boston. Um, and then I had just gotten married up in the Northeast and my wife's family's from New Jersey. And so I had family visiting me from New Orleans. They first came to my wedding and then they came visited me in Boston. Mm. and uh the family that was staying with me was my aunt and uncle and um their three kids and their oldest daughter nadia she was 12 years old at the time it just yep. came out of conversation with my aunt that she was that nadia was having trouble in math so i asked mm. nadia about it she said she's having trouble with unit conversion because of that she was placed mm -hmm. into a slower math track and i don't think either of them fully appreciated that if you're put into a slower math track in you know middle school it stays with yeah. you your whole life yeah. So I said, Nadia, yeah. I'm, I want to work on this with you. I'm 100% sure <laughs> you can understand this material. How about when you go back to New Orleans, I tutor you? So <laughs> she agreed. I think she was skeptical. But um, then she goes back to New Orleans. This was, uh, yeah, August of 2004. I just started tutoring her over the phone. We used, you know, there was very basic forms of Internet communication, yes. instant messenger, Yahoo Doodle, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. We yeah. used... Um, but but slowly but surely, you know, the first two weeks I was just trying to rebuild her self-esteem when it came Confidence, to math and science. Yeah, yeah, but once yeah. that she got unit conversion, then I started to you know mm. get her caught up with her class, and she frankly she got yep. a little ahead of the class. And at wow. that point, I called up her school and I said, I think Nadia Rahman should be able to retake that placement exam from last year. They said, mm. Who are you? I said, I'm her cousin, <laughs> and they let her. And the same Nadia who was Wonderful. originally tracked into let's call right. it a remedial track was then put into yeah. an advanced track. So I was hooked. Mm. It was a small intervention for me. So I started tutoring her younger brothers. Word spreads in my family. Before I know it, I'm tutoring uh, 10, 15 cousins every day after after work. So that's, uh, and, so, <laughs> and that was pretty intense, I guess. You did many sessions, right, to get there. It was not like just a couple of yeah, weeks. I mean, you know, in anything in life, yeah, I mean, anything in life's got to be re regular, <laughs> you know, 20 minutes. Any piano yes, teacher will yes. tell you, and I don't yes. play piano, but any <laughs> Any piano teacher would tell you, you do 10, 15, 20 minutes a day of regular deliberate yeah. practice, that's yeah. going to add up. So that's what I was trying to do with my cousins. Uh, uh, okay. And my wife at the time, she was a medical resident. Um, so I had, so she was working 30 hour shifts. So I had time on my hands. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> and so what was the, the moment, the trigger, where after doing those experiments with the family members and more, maybe some friends, you said, hey, here comes the, the Khan Academy. This is my vocation. This is my life. <laughs> or was it more of a gradual process where, you know, you iterated and decided to give it a shot? Yeah, you know, um, if you had asked me in 2003, 2004, what I, what I wanted to do when I'm 50 or 60 years old, I, I yeah. always said I wanted to start a school on my terms. Because always said that. I okay. always said All that right. because um, yeah. I, I, you know, even... My, my high school experience, I give it credit because it, it helped get me to where I got. But at yep. the same time, there were many things about that I wish I, that, that I think could have done uh, been yep. done differently. And I did OK, but I saw many of my peers who I think could have done very well, not do well. And I think it's because mm -hmm. the way things were structured um, and, and how they were motivated or not motivated. So I always I always felt that there would be a better way of, of doing yep. it. And yep. at the same time, you know, growing up fairly humble means uh, having a lot of mm. debt coming out of uh, undergraduate and yeah. business school I didn't think that you know especially when you, you have a background in tech or business and you can work at a hedge fund yeah. and I'm like okay I'm not going to go I'm gonna go that route first <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and and what I would rationalize to myself is I would yes I said I'm gonna do that until I could become independently wealthy then once I'm independently yeah. wealthy, I'm going to start a school on my terms so I don't have to ask okay. anyone's permission. That's kind of what I kept telling myself. That was the, the reason. So, yeah, so yeah. In, in, when my cousins needed tutoring, there was a little bit of a motivation of like, well, you know, if I keep hmm. telling myself this, but let me get into the problem a little bit. Let me start working hmm. on it. Um, then, you know, with a software background, I, as we all know, you know, if you yep. make software that's useful for even 10 people, there's no reason why yep. it can't be useful for 10 million people. 
So I started um, writing software for them to give them practice, feedback. Then a yep. friend suggested that I make videos to supplement that. I initially thought it was skeptical because videos felt very low tech, but I did yep. that. And, and those took on a life of their own. I, I just hosted them mm -hmm. on YouTube, people discovered them. So by 2007, 2008, there were you know, you know, 40, 50,000 folks who are using the videos, using the software. Yep. So then I started to think, okay, this could be one day be a real thing. I always thought I would start a physical school, but yep. this could be a virtual school. And, yep. um, and, but I still thought I was to work at the hedge fund for another five, 10 years until I could quote, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't and I am not independently <laughs> yes. wealthy, yeah. but by yeah. the time, um, 2008, 2009 came along and, you know, there were so many people use, I had frankly had trouble focusing on my day job and I felt like there's uh -huh. a real, something real here. So yeah. uh, my wife and I, we looked at our finances. She was still doing her fellowship. Our first child mm. had just been born in 2009. Mm. It was like, you know, I, I, the social return on investment here is so high. Let me work yeah. on this for a year and, and, and we'll live off of savings and see if mm. I can find someone to, to support this. Um, so that we can at least keep going. And so that's when I, I took took the plunge. I set up as a not-for-profit 2008 with the mission Free yeah. World Class Education for Anyone Anywhere. Yeah. And 2009, yeah. quit my day job. So basically it gave you one year to kind of succeed or prove yourself that was something that could be sustainable. And you decided as well, Sal, to to actually set up a non-for-profit, right? Was it was it something you, you debated in your mind in terms of the form, the shape of of a social enterprise, non-profit, foundation, as opposed to a commercial business of education. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The whole time I did it, I always said, hey, this is going to be something that's just, you know, anyone should be able to access it. Like, that was my mental framework. I hadn't yep. thought about what its corporate structure would be at, at the time. Yep. Then... Um, in 2007, 2008, I lived, by this point, I had actually, the firm I worked for had moved out to Silicon Valley. So I was living in the middle of Silicon Valley. Mm. And uh, people started to reach out to me saying, hey, what I, we think what you're doing is really interesting. Um, and a few offered to write a check right then and there, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, you could support your family and work on this project. And it was very, in, it was very mm. tempting. Um, but by the second or third meeting, when we started talking about like, you know, okay, well, what are you going to, how are you going to monetize it? What's the premium offering? What are you going to put behind a paywall or even advertising? I was like, well, you know, I don't want people, yeah. like even in the early days on YouTube, I could have turned on the ads, but I was like, I don't yes. want someone to watch yeah. an ad if they want to learn algebra. So, yes. you know, and I, I just never turned the ads on. And the, um, so I, I kind of went through a mental exercise of like, okay, uh, imagine a home run as a for-profit. Maybe you can yeah. become the next Facebook or Microsoft or Google, that's great. Yep. <laughs> those, yep. All of those types of companies do, you know, are able to do huge impact at scale. Yep. Uh, but then I thought, well, what's a home run in a not-for-profit space? And it, you know, there's an mm. irony here because in business school, when I took the, there's a class called social enterprise, yeah. which is yeah. about nonprofits. I didn't take that class seriously at all. <laughs> I, I, in, at, at Harvard Business School, because? they don't grade you, but um, yeah. they'll tell you if they would, <laughs> if you would have failed the class. And that's one <laughs> class that I completely punted, and and I essentially got a three in that class, which meant I got the bottom ten percent because I didn't take okay. it that seriously. You didn't take it. Yeah. So, but there was a certain irony here in that now, <laughs> I was, I said, wow, <laughs> maybe the structure to do this here is is like what what's the home run here? Because as as my hedge fund, I would talk to yeah. company, you know, publicly traded companies five six a day, and I saw how capital structure. And mm. having annoying people like me calling them, really trying to figure out what their EPS were going to be this coming quarter, yeah. how much yeah. that actually drove their incentives. And yes. when, even if you have a founder who has control of the organization, who has an altruistic mission, as soon as it gets sold to someone else or they become a minority uh, voter, the, the, the company will evolve, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways, while this 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 hobby, this this baby of mine, Khan Academy, yes. <laughs> it, I was like, well, I, I, I want this thing to be around for, for past me, and I want it to always yes. be focused mm. on this mission. And I was like, mm. well, the only way to do that is as a not-for-profit. And imagine a yes. home run as a not-for-profit. Not-for-profit mm. home runs are even less likely than for-profit home runs, but yes. when they when they do succeed, they, they yeah. transform the world. What are the not-for-profit yes. home runs? Imagine the great <laughs> universities of the world, your Oxford, your Cambridge, your yep. Harvards. Yep. Yep. Imagine the great institutions, the Smithsonian's, the mm. uh, museums, the <clears throat> library systems of the world. Mm. And I was like, well, wh wh why couldn't Khan Academy? And it was a little bit delusional at the time. You know, maybe yeah. I've been reading too many <laughs> science fiction books. But I said, why couldn't Khan Academy be an institution like 
a great university, but it exists on the internet. Yeah. The internet yeah. had all of the other analogs to the real yeah. world, right? You could buy things on the internet. You could socialize yeah. on the internet. Why couldn't you, you learn could, on the internet? And why couldn't yeah. it be like the public school system, but at a bigger scale? No exciting vision. You know, as you shaped this vision, uh, uh, Sal, early on in the first few years, I, I wonder when and how you decided, because you, you are very articulate, but what I'm calling uh, some key principles, uh, such as uh, very much a student-centered approach, very much adopting the mastery learning theory, or actually more than a theory of practice. Can you tell us more about that, the way you picked up some of those core principles, and maybe educate a little bit our listeners on mastery learning, which is something interesting I found. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, in my own personal experience, like even when I was in high school and in college, I found that I learned much faster not going to class and listening to lectures and mm. sitting with a textbook and just trying to go at my own pace through the textbook and, and doing as many problems <laughs> as possible. As you could, yeah. yeah. Um, and then sometimes if there were other peers in the room asking them a few <laughs> questions or me answering their questions, when we yeah. did it that way, I would learn 10 times faster. Um, yeah. And so I had that experience. Then I also had the experience that in high school, I, I was, you know, the, the president of the math club. So, you know, not, oh, <laughs> but our, our math club was cooler than most. Uh, but yeah. <clears throat> the, the school actually took us pretty serious. They they mm. created a program. We actually almost became part of the faculty where mm. any student who was having trouble at our entire high school was then tutored by yeah. the math club. And wow. so we had like 70 or 80 members in our, in our <clears throat> and, and, what, and it was all peer tutoring. Mm. And I saw time and time again, these students, <laughs> a lot of my classmates or, you know, some who were younger, who hated math, who, you know, but they came because they had to have at least a C to stay on the football team or have a C to stay on the basketball <laughs> team or be a cheerleader. Yeah. So they would come to this tutoring session and I would be the lead tutor and there would be, huh. you know, 10 or 20 other <clears throat> other tutors. And I saw that when you when you gave these students kind of personal attention and you mm. actually explained the concepts in intuitive ways, some yeah. of these kids who thought they hated math joined the math club. So we had, you know, we had guys from the football team on the math club, very unusual. <laughs> <laughs> because they liked it and they would come to math competitions yeah. with us because they realized that it was really interesting. So I saw that it, transformation. You make it happen. fun as well. Do you make it fun for those we guys? We made it was fun, it like interesting. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and, then, and, then, and then they just started getting A's in their math class. Mm. They showed up yeah. hoping to even pass, yeah. but once mm. they filled in some of their gaps and got motivated, they were getting A's and they were finding it easy yeah. and they were going to math yeah. competitions. I saw, you know, this was when I was 16 years old. I was seeing this. Wow, wow. That's and, pretty and, cool. You know, I, I saw the same, even at, even at a place like MIT, I saw the difference between Students mm. who are showing up prepared and students who are yeah. showing up unprepared. No, no, no matter no matter how hardworking you are, if you show up at a yes. place like MIT with gaps in your calculus or gaps in your physics, you're going to yeah. struggle. And so I found yeah. myself sometimes peer tutoring some kids in my dorm and this and that and saw it had mm. helped them. Nadia, I saw the same thing. Nadia yeah. thought she was bad at math. A little bit of intervention <laughs> of personalization. So that helped form this idea that, look, if people just got, had the opportunity and the incentive to fill in any gaps they have. If they have yep. more practice and less lecture, <laughs> and, that's, yes. and, and that practice is with immediate feedback and, yeah. and, and it's at the level that they need, right? Sometimes we get practice on things we don't need, but practice on the yeah. things you actually need that people Individual can learn dramatically needs. faster. I didn't yes. have a word for it at that point, yeah. but <laughs> I said, this is what we need to build. <laughs> this is what, yeah. so that's Khan Academy I started building. It was only about, um, it was in it, about 2010, that I realized hmm. that this wasn't my idea. There was a word for this. <laughs> it's, yes. it's called mastery learning. And yes. it's arguably the oldest way of learning. And in fact, it's the way that you learn anything that is mission critical. It's the way, yeah. it's the way that if, you are, if, you're, if you're in the military, they do hmm. mastery learning. They don't say, oh, you kind of know how to operate the fo rifle. Now let's move on to grenades. <laughs> they yes. say, no, no, you need to know how to do no. this because your life is, depends on it. Of so course. we're going to work yeah. on it until you really master it. If a musical yes. instrument you don't just glaze over it and hope you get a C on it and move on to the next. You keep yep. working on it. You really master your yep. craft. Uh, yes. Marshall, I mean, I could go, go down the list. And well, in yeah. most of human history, <clears throat> this is the way that people learned. It's just, it was very expensive, right? If you're Alexander the Great, you had Aristotle mm. as your tutor, and you probably had yeah. a few other tutors. Yes, <laughs> they can personalize for you. They can make sure yes. you master you know, military strategy or economics or whatever yep. it is. But w about 200 years ago, uh, when we introduced this idea of free mass mm. public education, we had to make a compromise. Uh, mm. We said, okay, we can't give everyone a personal <laughs> tutor. Let's put students in batches mm. of 25, 30 students. 
Let's yep. apply some processes to them, give them some lecture, move them together at the same pace. And every two, three, four weeks, we give them a test. Some kids will do well, some kids won't. Too bad. We keep Too that bad. process. After about 10, 12 years, we start sorting them out. The kids who consistently have you know, good grades, they will go into this field. The kids in the middle grades go to these. The other and kids those. can become laborers of some kind. That was the Industrial Revolution. And we've essentially yep. had that same model all the way to today. Now, yes. what's interesting is if, if we were talking 100 years ago about mastery learning, we'd both agree mm. it's a good idea, but we're like, how can you do it for every yes. student? Of course. What's exciting now is with the help of technology, you can actually have one teacher with a classroom of 30, but have it yeah. a situation where uh, he or she can actually personalize for every student. And also, the world we live in is now demanding that. It's not okay to yeah. have the Industrial Revolution pyramid of labor anymore, where most people yeah. are ending up fairly unskilled. We now need the opposite. Most people need to end up fairly skilled. So even more important that people are able yeah. to master their statistics, their math, their reading and writing. I think it makes a tons of sense. So obviously, the, the big challenge is how do you scale that to, uh, to the anti-education system, not just in the US, but in the world. That's, that's a bigger question that I'm sure you've been thinking a lot about. Uh, I love the way you, you framed it, uh, Sal, when you talked about, actually, it's a life critical thing. Uh, as you talked about military and you made the analogy to education, it's life critical for people. Each one of the, the kids uh, should have a chance, in a way, to, to go and keep learning all the time. Now, I'd like to, to connect the dots between the education learning process and the entrepreneurial process. If I may, I'd like to use uh, the example of Sarah Sarvasti theory called effectuation. You may have heard about that, on, uh, I'm sure, Sal, because you know so much about entrepreneurship as well. But for listeners, let me just uh, tell them what it is very quickly. It is basically an approach where you identify the next best step by assessing the resources available in order to achieve your goals, okay? And it's built around a few core principles. One is bird in hand. You have to create solution with the resource you have here and now, okay? Not project yourself being rich and so on yet. Two, this is about the affordable loss. You should only invest as much as you're willing to lose. And you talked about the one year you had in mind about how much you could lose yourself uh, starting in the, the Khan Academy. And the third one is the lemonade principle. Mistakes and surprise are inevitable and can be used to look for new opportunities all the time. So I was wondering all some of those ideas applied, you know, in a, in, a, in a way that was not necessarily formal, but you just did it in your own experience. And particularly when it comes to mistake and surprise, and if you could share with our listeners, well, one or two big mistakes or big good or bad surprise along the way that got you to the next level in terms of, you know, expanding the impact of the Khan Academy. Yeah, you know, I like that framework. Um, I know it does describe a lot of not only how I operated back in the day, but frankly still do. And I, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, th there, you can be kind of a local optimizer, as you just described. Yeah. But um, unless you have a clear goal that local Vision. optimization can take you into random places. Yes. And you know, in the late nineties, I did their traditional entrepreneurship and your traditional entrepreneur, you're just trying to make a startup and you will, <laughs> <laughs> that local optimization will take you here, yes. then there, there. And yeah. I think what was different for me, and I think it's been key for Khan Academy is yes, absolutely a ton of local optimization and figuring out how much I can invest while still being able to cut loose a little bit. But I also, um, Maybe add a third. I added a, 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 a second principle here, which I, I, yep. I and I told myself this even when I quit my day job for a year. I said, I want to make this thing unkillable. So even if mm. even if I don't succeed in that first year, I'm not going to give it up. It's too important. This is going to be mm. somehow it's going to be part of my life's work. And then I'll hopefully yep. just try to go back and get a job, a real job, <laughs> and then still work on it. And then maybe in another four or five things. years, try again. So mm. that's one. Uh, I, I guess that does to go back to the, you know, what are you, what losses are you willing to take? Yes. Um, yeah. And, uh, but not give up on it. And then the other one is having this very big true north that like, hey, yes. I really want to have a shot at making this be an institution that helps, yes. you know, because look, if someone Millions. else pulls it off, that's great. I mean, that's the other difference yeah. thing about social entrepreneurship. If someone else solves yes. a problem, sure. Awesome. But like, I didn't think, and I still don't think that if, if Khan Academy were, didn't exist, I don't think anyone else is actually trying to solve, solve this really? very important problem. Even, even today, you don't see other initiatives in the world trying to achieve kind of the same purpose in mind as well? You'll hear, a, well, you know, the global public education system is. Yeah, of but course. I think, yeah. and, and we work with them. We don't view ourselves yeah. as a replacement. Um, but 
they try to, but they they have a lot of inertia around the old ways, so to speak. Yep. And so that's why they're eager to partner with us because we can fill yep. in their gaps where yep. they can. We can also be a safety net where there's not. But, you know, it, it, there's a certain irony that in, in 2010, um, if you talk to venture capitalists, they would say the one mm. space that they're not going to invest in is ed tech. Ed tech mm. was horrible. <laughs> they said it's, it's, the education marketplace is so bizarre. There's, yep. Yeah. And then when we came on the scene and we showed that you could, there was actually a scalable product market mm -hmm. fit, so to speak, you know, when we were scaling to million, five million, yeah. then all of a sudden, in, in a weird way, we helped unlock the ed tech um, opportunity for startups. Opportunity. And so, <laughs> yeah. to your point, there are yeah. other people working on the problem loosely, primarily yes. from the for profit. And yes. some are doing good things, but I think mm -hmm. what we're now seeing is. A lot of them, even though they might have started with a very similar mission to Khan Academy of like, let's democratize mm -hmm. education, because of what their true north is, which isn't bad, it's just inevitable, they've had to go to corporate training. They've had to go yeah. to, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of folks like the MOOCs and things like that. Mm -hmm. In order to yeah, yeah, yeah. create a return for their for profit investors, they have to go into corporate training. I'm going to, you know, you already have a college degree, but I'm going to give you another skill that can get you a job. And that's good. That's all important stuff. But in terms of people saying, okay, we genuinely want to make everything from pre K through the core of college free or yep. as free or as close to free as possible, let's call it accessible, and then yep. <laughs> make that a pathway. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of well intentioned people who talk about it, but very few organizations that are actually doing it. Yeah. So uh, I, I like to to build on this dialogue we have on education, obviously, and particularly understand the way you've been or not influenced by, uh, you know, a famous uh, author, Carol Dweck, of course, with her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success and a Gross Mindset. I must say, within Microsoft, we've been quite inspired for the last almost eight years now in our transformation by trying to challenge ourselves with a better more open mindset from time to time, as opposed to be a rigid mindset all the times, because nobody's perfect anyways. But tell, tell me more about the way that that book and publication or philosophy has influenced or not the way you've been shaping, again, the learning process and the teaching process as well. Yeah, and, and you know, this is another one of these things like mastery learning, which I did not, I did not know about Carol Dweck and growth mindset yeah. until um, I became an educator, <laughs> of a formal <laughs> educator of sorts. Um, but, you know, for, for those folks listening, it's really mm. just this idea that in, in a domain, folks tend yep. to have either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. A fixed mindset yep. is I'm either good at this or I'm not, maybe because of my DNA. And a mm. growth mindset is I don't know how good I am at this. Uh, and the way I'm going to find out is I keep stepping out of my comfort zone. And I keep and, and I view failure as not a, yeah. a failure. I view yeah. it as an opportunity to grow. And, yeah. you know, Carol Dweck, not only are there all sorts of studies that people with yes. a growth mindset in a domain are the ones who succeed in that domain. But yep. Carol Dweck and others also show that you can do interventions to people to mm -hmm. help them grow their growth mindset. So remind them that their brain is like a muscle. The more they use it, the stronger it gets. You have more <clears throat> neural connections for them when yep. you make a mistake and you reflect mm. on it than when you get something right. So, um, what, you know, my whole, my whole life journey, a lot of my, was, my <laughs> what was, was all about I, I did not mindset. realize this. I mean, in yes. certain areas, like in sports, <clears throat> I probably did not have as much of, now I have a growth mindset. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I'm a pretty athletic, uh, uh 40, ah, 46 okay. year old, uh, now, but I was right. not athletic. <laughs> we talk about it later. <laughs> my only uh, uh, my only trophy in high school was I had the highest GPA on the wrestling team. Okay. So that, but 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 actually I will take credit for I did have a growth mindset. That's why I joined the wrestling team because right. I knew I needed to step out of my comfort zone. That was not yes. my comfort zone to be on the wrestling yeah. team. And I yeah. always you know I was actually quite shy in high school. Hmm. I ran for student government. I lost. That was growth mindset. Then when I went to yeah. college, I was still kind of on the shyer side. I joined an hmm. improv comedy team. Right, like yep. th those are things that I now, in hindsight, realize. Okay, yeah. I yeah. I was fortunate because I was pu pushing myself mm. outside of my outside pushing of my co comfort zone, and so yeah. I saw that with Nadia. Like, I had you know certain <laughs> cousins. Nadia was not doing well in math, 
but she was willing to engage. <clears throat> she was willing to work with me, listen, work on problems. I had a few family members and friends who I tried to, I'm like, hey, I, I, I'm doing this thing. They're like, no, 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 you know, not for me. I'm not into it. I don't want to. They had more of yeah. a fixed mindset. Um, yeah. And so I saw that. And so when Khan Academy was happening, and that's when I started to really learn about Carol Dweck and her work, I was like, once again, like mastery learning, there's a whole framework yep. around this. And so yep. it's definitely something that we've taken to heart. And I gave a, a, a talk, um, uh, a TED, this was uh, the, uh, 2015, about mm -hmm. how everyone in education talks about growth mindset now. They talk about the importance of it. But at yep. the same time, a traditional education system completely Doesn't. goes against what a growth mindset, yes. right? A teacher will say, hey, you should have a growth mindset. You know, nothing's wrong with getting a question wrong. You should just try again. But then they say, okay, and here's your test paper. You just got a D. You're a D student <laughs> or you <Too> failed. Bad, <laughs> bad on yeah. you, right? Yeah. You should be embarrassed. And I know teachers yeah. don't want that. That's not yeah. what they intend. Teachers yeah. want the growth mindset. But there's, you know, the system. It's not the teacher. The system, the system yeah. is making that happen. If a yeah. real growth mindset <laughs> is mastery learning. Okay, yeah. you're at 80% right now. Yep. Keep working on it until you get a 90% or maybe move on to the next thing. But at any time, if you want to make that 80% to a 90%, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do that. I mean, yep. if you think yep. about it, it's really crazy that our grade books that we have in high school and college that you can't go back <laughs> and improve the grade. You yep. know, when I tell some educators, they think I'm, wait, that's cheating. I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. if the student really knows the material, then yeah. that, that C or that F in that on their transcript is actually a lie. They know yes. the material now, but it's saying that they don't. So, um, you know, growth mindset, mastery learning, two sides of the same coin. No, I fully agree. Actually, I actually have a big fan, uh, Sal, about mentoring and coaching. Uh, something I do in my foundation as well. And I'm, you know, pretty deep uh, in respecting people who can listen deeply, uh, people who can have uh, infinite curiosity. And I, I love, you know, given, given the fact you, you discussed since inception of Khan Academy about the power of a strong mentor or tutor, depending on the worlds you're going to use. Actually, I'm going to use your worlds. <laughs> How do you see that going forward in terms of the scale of the Khan Academy? Uh, because there's a combination both of the one-to-one, -one, which, you know, can obviously work super well, like you do with your cousin, but how much scale can you achieve with that? But there's also the peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, uh, actually experience which is wonderful, which I see with my entrepreneurs as well, such entrepreneurs. They learn so much solving problems, you know, from each other, as opposed to ask any adult supervision in a way. So what is your philosophy and the way you see it scaling uh, to enable a gross mindset even more, actually? Uh, absolutely. You, you know, what we've built at Khan Academy now is the students can start in pre-K and learn at their own time and pace and master concepts and get videos and do practice at personalized. And they can go all the way into yep. calculus and physics and biology and history, and they can do everything. But the reality is, is that there's very few students who will have the motivation on their own yep. to go, go through all. There are examples. Hmm. I mean, there's a young girl in Afghanistan, Taliban kept her from going to school. Khan Academy hmm. became her education. There was a hmm. young man who was in jail. He gets out. Even while he was in jail, he had some access. That became his education. Hmm. So we have these stories. But generally yep. speaking, the human element, the human support, mentorship, tutoring is key. Uh, hmm. You know, I always say if I had to pick even for my own kids, the best technology with no yep. human versus the best human with no technology, I would pick the best human with no, no technology any day. <laughs> yes. So yeah. what, what I've always been fascinated about, okay, we're gonna make Khan Academy as much content, practice, game mechanics, make it as engaging as possible. But yep. for most <laughs> students, the, the real place where they're still going to engage with learning is through their teachers and through their yep. classrooms. And so mm -hmm. that's why we've invested so much on working with the traditional hmm. public education system, making tools for teachers. They should view Khan Academy as almost their teaching assistant, yep. Um, yep. As, as, as something that, could, that can uh, assist them. Hmm. And you know, the best use cases of Khan Academy hmm. have been where peers can use it together, where I'm working yes. on something, but if I need help, I could go to you. And the way yep. that we've been trying to scale that is <laughs> By you know, we have another not-for-profit we started, a sister nonprofit yep. to Khan Academy called Schoolhouse.World, yep. which does peer-to-peer yep. -peer tutoring. Hmm. Uh, and so you could be a six, just as what we, I was doing in high school, but now you yeah, can yeah. do it across tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of students um, all, all over the world. So you know, big the big picture goal is we want to do let the technology do as much as possible, but yep. then also can the technology facilitate other peer-to-peer -peer interactions. 
so that yep. you can provide all the layers of support someone someone needs. I'll I'll throw out you know the the other idea yep. that not just idea that we're mm. working on is an intermediary, mm. which is I think artificial mm. intelligence is becoming very 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 interesting. Well, I'd love to get back to that in a few minutes, so <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind, because that's something pretty pretty hot right now. Uh, I, I'd love to to talk a little bit about positive leadership, positive psychology, which as as you know is at the core of this dialogue I'm having actually with many guests. And you know, one of the first step of uh, practicing positive leadership is first of all, taking care of yourself, <laughs> of oneself, by working on your well-being, your physical energy, your mental energy, and uh, basically building and managing your positive energy in yourself every single day. I understand that as an example, because I'm sure you have many other practices I'd like you to share with your listeners, you are uh, an advocate of taking a, a cold shower every day or, or maybe a couple of times a week. I know I've tried myself. I'm not doing that every single day of my life. So can you share with us such practices? You also talk about sports that you have been raising, it seems to me, uh, in your life as well. So what are those habits, you, routines you built into your daily, weekly cadence now? Yeah, no, it's, um, I am a big believer in some of these habits that like, when you when you get your day off to the right foot, it it yeah. it builds momentum. At least it does for oh, me. Yeah. So you know, Same. I wake up. You know, this morning I woke up at six in the morning. We actually just got a dog, so I took her for a walk. Oh wow! Um, wonderful. And she's actually a new here. one. Trying to she's eat here. some tape. Okay. That's why I'm every now and then I'm looking down. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> you know, the first thing I do in the morning, to your point, is I take a cold shower, and. Yeah. Yes, it is jarring, right? And actually, I, I, I take a shower in my kid's bathroom because our shower doesn't get cold enough. Um, <laughs> it doesn't get, give you that pure cold water. So um, I take a, a shower there. Um, and, you know, you do it a while. It, you actually start looking forward to it. The first 10, 15 seconds are always hard. But that feeling afterwards, you don't need coffee. You don't need anything. You're, you feel And then you're like, OK, nothing else in my day is going to be any harder than that. Um, <laughs> Then I, I actually am very um, ritualistic about making my bed or making yes. my, my and my wife's bed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I do that. And then, okay. um, you know, I, I most days I'll try to meditate about 20 to 30 minutes uh, okay. as well. So that's kind of like my my morning You're, thing. And then yeah. on top of that, most days now this will sound kind of extreme. And please, I don't want people to take, you know, my <laughs> advice. I don't eat until I get all of my work done. Hmm, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> Is it your reward, actually? <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 one, I, I um, eat healthier okay. and better when I'm more relaxed. Yeah. And I yeah. tell myself, like, hey, get all your work done, and then you'll get a nice, relaxing meal. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I usually end up, you know, that meal is normally dinner. So, yeah. But I find that it actually makes me more productive and clearer thinking and you know now intermittent fasting is obviously a big thing and there's yeah, a lot yeah. of uh data that backs it up but th those are yeah. kind of my um somewhat odd rituals <laughs> are you all, are, are you also pretty religious about your sleep and the quality of your sleep so i yeah well i find everything that i just described um only only enhances your sleep right like if, hmm. if you if you're if you're eating well and not overeating you're taking cold sure. showers you uh, get a lot of exercise in the day. I mean, the only thing, other thing I would add to that, yeah, I, you know, probably two or three times a week, I go for a couple yeah. of mile run, lift yeah. weights, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. that whole combination, the meditation, it, it definitely makes your sleep, you sleep better. well. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, another support network. You know, uh, I was having recently Bill George, a former CEO of Medtronic and professor at Harvard Business School. And, uh, and Bill uh, has been part of a men's group for decades. And he's a huge advocate of having, basically was having, a, and I think you are having as well, what, what is a regular meetup in your local community, if I'm not mistaken. I heard you talking about that. So can you tell me more about it? What does it work for you? And what do you get out of that? And, and your friends as well, as part of this regular community connection you have. Yeah, you know, this was a um, thing that, you know, my wife and I, we both grew up in, in um, Muslim families, but neither of us, neither of our families were particularly religious and, and, and we weren't either. But we always said, you know, there is something nice about having a, uh, a religious, some type of community and that yeah. you get together on a regular basis and you talk about things that transcend the day to day of paying your taxes and your career and all of that. Yeah. And yeah. so we said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had a place where we could do that, but it, it isn't. Uh, limited to people of your own faith and mm -hmm. it could be broader it could talk about philosophy and etc yep. so 
uh, one of the things that we started about two, three years ago is mm -hmm. um, I would send out like a quote to a bunch of friends on, via mm -hmm. email. And pre-pandemic, we started meeting in a park. Um, okay. And it, we would just talk about things like, you know, purpose um, hmm. or ego or yeah. Um, yeah. the nature of reality or whatever. <laughs> and, and some of the quotes, some of the reading would be from religious traditions, hmm. but it would be from multiple religious traditions. And yep. it was, and we would start with the meditation. And so it was a really nice thing. And then once, once the mm. pandemic started, we did this over Zoom. And it, it was nice because we were able to get people from a broader yeah. um, area. Yeah. So, and you we've continue been doing that after it, the uh, pandemic as consistently. Well? Yeah. Um, uh -huh. The last couple of months, we've fallen yeah. off a little bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I did find that by doing it, it, it definitely grounds you a lot better for the week. No, I love that. Uh, I love that. And I believe, uh, I believe deeply in that community. Uh, belonging as well, whatever you call your community, which could vary as well by country, by place in the world. Uh, I think you said at once, you said, if we want to change the world, we need to educate the world, right? This is kind of underpinning your, your vision. Uh, and you're clearly on a mission to do this, uh, Sal. We talked a lot about the Khan Academy, but you've actually also expanded your impact by creating the Lab School, which is a bricks and mortar school you set up in 2014, I think, California. You describe it as a student center school where kids learn by themselves and teachers assist them. Uh, in a way, a total inversion of the usual power structure that you find in a traditional classroom. So can you tell us in a few hours, how does it work actually in a real world, that system? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, back in 2012, 2013, I was telling the world about all these ideas and then my own son in 2014 was going to ent uh, be school aged. And I said, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, two, I wanted my own children to be able to benefit from this. And I wanted to show the world that it's doable, that you could do this in a physical environment. So that's why we started Khan Lab School. And um, it works pretty much as you just described, where students are able to, for the most part, learn at their own time and pace. If they haven't mastered something, they always have the opportunity incentive to go back and master it. And mm -hmm. what happens is because they're able to, frankly, learn more official, efficiently here, and they're learning for learning the material versus... Yeah just getting a grade, um, they're more intrinsically motivated, they're more communal in that they help each other a lot, yeah. uh, and they actually it frees up time for other things, so more passions, more, you know, a lot of our students at the high school, at Khan Lab School, they are doing internships that are traditionally only available to fairly advanced college students. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. They're starting businesses. They're doing this and that. And then once again, that's because they're not just jumping through hoops like most high school students yeah. have to. They're yeah. actually able to pursue their passions while mastering the content. Hmm. I'd like to finish with a couple of last questions, uh, Sal. Uh, I know when you talk about the future of education, you often relate to science fiction and a vision where anyone will have access to any content to be a fully actualized person. What do you mean by that, actually? What is an actualized person? Can you... Can you make it real for us? <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, the reason I get to that is when you think about education, in any problem you're trying to solve, it's, I think it's good to always think, like, what's the whole point? At first mm. you say, okay, education, I want to help. Like with Nadia, okay, I want to help her get good grades. Why do I want to help her get good? Well, she has good grades, then she'll have more opportunity. Why do I want her to have more opportunity? Well, she has more opportunity. She'll have better self-esteem, better relationships. She'll be able to support herself better. Okay, well, why do I want her to do that? Well, she can do that. She'll be less dependent on other people, and she'll be able to contribute to the mm -hmm. world. And frankly, she'll just have a happier, more meaningful life. So yeah. the goal of education <laughs> is to allow more people to have a happy and meaningful life. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, I think you and I, we're fortunate <laughs> to be, they're not that yes. there's not things that we can't work on, but we are fortunate to have reasonably fully actualized lives. Uh, we, yes. we have... Uh, intellectually stimulating work. We get to work with interesting people, meet interesting people. We have yep. a sense of purpose uh, that we're, we're able to make some positive impact. So um, that's all hmm. I would want for anyone on the planet. Um, I love and, you know, and it's not even a wealth thing that I yeah. remember Jeff Bezos, re you know, said all he wants for his children is to have a sense of purpose. He's 100 yeah. percent right. You know, hmm. I see out here, um, you know, out here in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of wealth and some yeah. kids of wealth, the wealth can be very demoralizing because they lose they lose their self sense of purpose. And so, <laughs> you know, as long as you feel like, OK, I do this thing and I'm trying to do it with excellence. I have a growth mindset about it and I can um, I have a shot at contributing to the world and yep. <clears throat> supporting myself and having a family, then that's that's a good life. I 100 percent agree with you. Very last question, because it's something quite buzzy, but I think it goes far beyond the buzz. 
you know, with artificial general intelligence, large language models, and of course, the infamous ChatGPT3, <laughs> how do you see the role of the teacher changing, so? And how, how will you change your learning approach, if you are considering it, for your students as they use such tools in their day-to-day -day activities? Because I just learned that all the universities in the world are now shutting down, of course, and prohibiting access to, <laughs> to ChatGPT3 to, 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 to actually uh, write your essays or, or some more work. So what is, what is your point of view on the way it's gonna, it's gonna happen in, within or without the control of the education system? Yeah, first of all, I think the education system is doing the exact wrong thing because mm -hmm. they're essentially trying to stick their hole in the, in the ground and hope that yep. nothing's happening. And all that's happening is this kids are just going to get around the firewall or if they, you know, or just go at home and use and still use these these models. And so they should have just rethought, OK, well, what what and, and in the future, they're going to be using these models to write papers, to write when they're in a work environment, white, white papers, et cetera. So it's like, I want you to embrace it. And maybe these models could actually do certain things that are enhancing of the yes. um, education experience. So, you know, chat GPT, we've also been experimenting with other uh, models yep. that, 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 that haven't been public yet. Um, they, they, they are very good. Like we are at the cusp of being able to have a Socratic mm -hmm. conversation with, yeah. you know, even chat GPT can yep. do it to a certain degree. So, that's where we should be thinking about it. Hey, this is an opportunity. When we think about, um, like right now on Khan Academy, a teacher could assign practice exercise. They can assign a video. But yeah. what if a large language model could have a Socratic conversation with you about the video? Mm -hmm. And then what if the large language model can write a synopsis of that conversation and send it to the teacher or send it to the parent? That all of a sudden is, it's now truly acting as a true teaching assistant an yes. excellent teaching assistant. And so yeah. that's what I'm interested in, is um, how this could potentially be another very, very uh, powerful modality, acting as a teaching assistant. And then from a student's point of view, uh, you know, a, a, a thing like Khan Academy is going to feel even that much more like a tutor or a mentor. They're yeah. going to be able to have conversations with it. So, yeah. you, you know, we're not there yet. The models yeah. aren't perfect. They still hallucinate. They still mm -hmm. make up stuff. They're yeah. infamously bad at math. Yeah. But... Um, I don't think the solution is to put our heads in the in the ground. I think the solution is, and you know, and I think there's even there's the essay issue. There's college admissions essay, you know, yeah. uh, and oh, so yeah. to me that says find something else to leverage instead of just putting your head in the ground because what's going to happen is now just the kids who are the rule breakers are going to be the ones who are going to benefit. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, I mean, thanks so much, so It was a wonderful, insightful, exciting, stimulating conversations and. Uh, Thanks for changing the world by educating people to be more happy and more fulfilled in their lives. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.